about residences and uh, con hotels and what around. So I thought it would be good to maybe everyone start with talking a little bit about the brands that they do represent and what the different jobs are and what, what you do in the market. So maybe start with Arjan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arjun de Boer. Um, I work for Region Hotels and Resorts. Uh, we've broken ground on Region Jakarta and Region Residences Jakarta on the corner of uh, Katotsu Brato and Suriman, next to, next to the, uh, the Crown Plaza. Exciting project um, with, a, with a lot of good consultants, large mixed developments. There's two office towers, service department, um, complex hotel and residential. With, uh, with KG Global, uh, uh, Jakarta-based developer. And that's our, our first entry into Indonesia with uh, branded residences. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Tisdell. I work with uh, FRHI Hotels and Resorts. It's a <coughs> pleasure to be here this morning. Um, FRHI Hotels and Resorts uh, is a hotel operator. We operate uh, 113 hotels uh, worldwide. We're exclusively focused on the upper upscale through ultra luxury uh, segments uh, with Swiss Hotel in the uh, upper upscale segment, Fairmont in the luxury segment, and Raffles occupying the ultra luxury uh, space. Uh, we're, uh, an important part of our business is residential. Uh, we've been in, uh, focused on mixed use really since the late 1990s. Uh, we see it as a very core and integral part of our business. Uh, in addition to the um, 70 RAF, or sorry, the 70 Fairmont hotels, the 31 Swiss hotels that we operate, and the 12 Raffles hotels, we have 18 residential projects that are in operation, another 30 that are under development. Uh, we're involved in uh, three categories, for sale branded residences, where we're licensing our brand to our third party development partners, typically co-located uh, with one of our hotels. Uh, and that's really been the driver of our residential business over the last decade or so. Uh, recently, we've expanded into the service <coughs> residence or extended stay category, if you will. Uh, those are, again, typically co-located with one of our hotels in a mixed-use development. Uh, it's a residentially designed product, which is retained in terms of ownership by our development partner, but then operated under one of our brands, and of course, an extended stay focus. And then private residence clubs, which is a business that, from a geographic perspective, grew up in the Americas. We've recently uh, opened our first couple private residence clubs overseas. Uh, more of a niche business for us right now is that category continues to rebound from the 2008-2009 uh, credit crisis. Uh, we don't see a, a lot of opportunity uh, for that product in Asia Pacific, but probably the one exception to that is right here in, in Bali. And so we're very active and continue to be active under the Fairmont Heritage Place brand. Uh, in terms of my personal involvement, I head up uh, residential development uh, in Europe, Africa, Middle East, and, and of course Asia Pacific and based in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, very similar to a develop hotel development role with the, the exception that my involvement really starts from identification of opportunities, negotiation, but then continues on through product design, uh, everything from structuring, physical design, uh, and des development of the service offering, uh, right through opening a supportive sales and marketing process, supporting our development partners as they take the product to market, and really through to stabilization of the asset. Thank you. Benny? Hi, I'm Ben. I'm with 21 Development Group. We are a 18 years development company We've been uh, doing residential, commercial, and uh, we are starting our hospitality division in 2006. Uh, we are, currently, we have a few hotels here in Bali, and, um, along East Java, and uh, coming up in Jakarta and Balikpapan. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Troy Sinclair. I'm here representing <coughs> Mentor Group Australia um, and Mentor Group Indonesia. Mantra Group is Australia's largest uh, accommodation manager. Uh, we, uh, we manage in Australia across uh, single-owned hotels, hotel management agreements, uh, management letting rights, which is known here as the condo hotel structure. Um, we moved into Indonesia um, about two and a half years ago. 
we have three properties here in Bali and uh, we're looking to grow that. So I guess um, in Indonesia and in Bali we've seen um, a lot of uh, residences and common hotels being built um, but now we see in the market there's a lot of challenges you know uh, for end users operators and so on and that sort of happens prior to maybe uh, the big brands like some of those you represent coming into the market. Uh, so I thought it would be good to start with maybe looking at the motivations for an, for an owner, you know, like a developer. Why, why would they consider doing residences rather than research? Some developers obviously specialize in, in, in doing all the residences, but we see a lot of combinations of, you know, hotels and residences. So I don't know. Uh, for our Jakarta property, we, we see it basically as being beneficial three ways. Um, Beneficial to the owners from a cash flow perspective, being able to, to uh, sell a residential component obviously helps them with their overall cash flow requirements. Um, it's beneficial to the operator where we get to manage a large inventory, also having a lot of guests making use of all our, our facilities that we manage on, on the property and really providing that lifestyle of, uh, of, of luxury services, spa, wellness, um, uh, gym, uh, which which may turn into more of a CrossFit experience uh, than than a traditional gym, and then in the end, um, the individual residential purchaser who is looking for that lifestyle where they can obtain um, access to all all the facilities that we have, um, butlers on calls, uh, private chefs coming in, uh, yeah. So there's a whole long list of a la carte options for the individual owners. And that's something that, they, that, that the, the high net worth in, individual does not want to bother with personally. They just like it to be managed. And these are individuals that have properties everywhere, from London to Singapore, sometimes Hong Kong. And they, you know, they just like it to be managed in a way where they don't have uh, too much trouble managing it personally. Maybe Jeff, what, what do you see as the main motivation from, from your owners, maybe? From, from our owners, I, I think uh, there are a couple of distinctions I think are helpful. The, the space is very, very broad. Um, so we have done historically what would be regarded as a typical condo hotel project, but typically we're, we're much more focused today on what we would describe as for sale branded residences. The, the difference really being that in a condo hotel, primary motivation for the buyer is investment. They're typically considered as keys of of the hotel, there are owner, there are personal use restrictions, and they have to be in the rental pool really the majority of the time. Whereas our, our products today are are much more sort of lifestyle oriented. There's still certainly investment dimensions to it. Uh, in terms of the benefits to the brand, or sorry, the benefits to the uh, developer, uh, you know, certainly our developers are looking for brand premium. They expect that if they license a Raffles or a Fairmont or a Swiss Hotel brand, they're going to get lift in terms of pricing. Uh, that's absolutely what we've seen across our projects, and there's some good research to validate that on a, on a, on a global basis that's been done by third parties. Uh, sales absorption uh, is also very important, and, and I think that's true both in, in strong, sort of bullish markets, but also in difficult markets. We've got a project in, uh, in Chengdu, which is really, Chengdu's in China, kind of a poster child, if you will, of difficult secondary Chinese residential markets. There, the developers capturing both the premium that they would expect, but they're outpacing their peers in terms of sales absorption, that, and that's very important. We're, in our projects, it's a mixed use context, and so typically our asset owners are uh, very much sort of core hotel investors, so they expect the residences to enhance the economics of their investment. Uh, and it, it does so by spreading out infrastructure costs across multiple, pro, pro, sorry, multiple asset classes, it's also uh, very important to them that they're able to offload, if you will, some of the overhead of operating the hotel. So there's small percentages of G&A, for instance, that are typically allocated to homeowner associations. Uh, there's the economy of scale of, of having that residential component and having the residential owners share in that. And of course, the value proposition from the consumer perspective is also significantly enhanced. The, while the costs are being offloaded to a certain extent from the hotel to the residences, of course the value proposition from a, from a consumer perspective is significantly better. So they're able to access the, the infrastructure, the amenities, the facilities of the hotel 
and really what you get is sort of a, a best of both worlds value proposition, one in which privacy and exclusivity is paramount, but at the same time, you really have the benefits of a, of a turnkey hotel lifestyle. So, Benny, you've been uh, going through the whole exercise in Indonesia, uh, and um, you've considered doing some changes on how you guys do it. What was sort of your motivations to, to take off in the first place on, on, on selling residences? Was it cash um, flow, or was it? Couldn't more agree with you there. We, uh, we, we think that the residential component is uh, well, we, we, we don't really have that kind of experience, uh, kind of mixed use. We have condo hotel, yes. But uh, in, 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 my, in my view, that, uh, if having that residential component do uh, add up to your, uh, your, your site, your project. Um, I, the way I see it, why, why the, uh, the investors, I mean, the, the uh, unit owner buys condo hotel because they, they expect to have a free stay, they expect to have the, uh, Capital gain from the uh, from the price of the uh, of the condo hotel itself, or the unit itself, and um, they also expect some return from the uh, from the hotel income, and um, it's, it's it's been a challenge for us to uh, to fulfill all that. Um, sometimes we uh, it's, it's it's hard to satisfy their expectation. So, so where do you see you guys going into the future with with this and? <laughs> We, uh, I don't think we're gonna do any more condo hotel for the moment. So we, we, we're gonna stick purely with hotels and uh, residential, managed residential, for sure. That's where, that's where we go in right now. So Troy, you're, you're representing Mantra into, into Bali and Indonesia now, and maybe in a time where sales of units and, and, and residences are not the best, what, what do you see the, develop, uh, sorry, the developers and the owners of these resorts? Um. <coughs> Well, coming from Mantra Group, um, really about 60% of our, um, our hotels in Australia are actually the condo hotel or the management letting uh, structure. And so it is really one of our core competencies. Um, coming into Indonesia is actually a great opportunity for us because there is a lot of the condo hotels being developed now and it's a, it's a, it's a mature market in Australia. And here it's still fairly new, the condo, condo hotel. Of course, we're seeing a lot of them going up uh, through Bali, but also through Greater Indonesia. Um, coming back to obviously what Arjun said, for the developers, it's a great way for them to actually get finance, uh, cash flow a project. Um, for a lot of developers, they don't actually want to hang around and be involved in the operation. Um, they're developers, they want to get on to their next development, and so for them to get in, sell, sell down the units, have someone else come in and operate it for them, and move on is, uh, is great for them. Um, for the operators, it's good because it can, can lead to obviously more projects being available to be managed. Um, and if they're managed correctly and the relationship between the, the developers and the operators is, uh, is a good one, it can then lead to actually benefits for the owners for if the investment is worthwhile. Uh, future developments, they may buy again in another development with a particular developer or a particular operator. Um, yeah. And I suppose for the operators too, this is also a, a unique sort of situation for a lot of uh, standard hotel, hotel managers. Moving into a space where you have multiple owners can be quite daunting. Um, it can be difficult, as yeah. ben, has, ben has mentioned, uh, because you go from handling one owner, which at times can be <laughs> a task, to managing up to 100, 200 owners, all with different expectations, all with a different investment strategy. Um, of course, they've all got their own idea on how the place should be run. Um, so managing that relationship between such a great number of owners can, can be a difficult one. And if you're not done correctly, it can lead to disaster. It can lead to um, you know, operations becoming more difficult than they need to be. So I guess that takes us into talking a bit about the operators, because we see resorts that, that obviously sell some unit, and we see resorts that sell all the units, and I guess that's quite quite challenging sometimes. I know some of the brands here have a clear formula on that, but, but what do you see as a typical challenge as an operator into residences and condo hotel suites? Well, we're, we're not so much in the condo hotel space. Um, the, the hotel component will always be much larger than the residential component, because that's basically our, our, our main business. We, we also find that if you, if you would have hundreds of individual owners 
the, the management requirement for that component of the development would be real, really difficult. You know, the, the, just the administrative aspect, the, the, all the additional work. Um, where sometimes you would even require to have a secondary team just servicing the, the individual owner's requirements. So, yes, we, I, I don't see us going into the, the condo, the condo tel space and also not in, into developments where all the rooms, 100% of the room inventory, of the hotel room inventory would be sold to individuals plus a residential component. I know in some markets it's quite common. Uh, for example, Kuala Lumpur. Developers there would absolutely love to, to sell and the hotel inventory as well as, as uh, the residential component. Uh, but I think, I think they have to be really cautious. Jeff? I think, I mean, generally we're, we're very positive and bullish on, on, on the category. Um, when, when we look at the space right now, uh, we think our mixed use capabilities are, are essential. In terms of the hotel opportunities that we're pursuing, I'd say somewhere in the range of 75% of those opportunities are mixed use uh, with a residential component and more often than not an office and a retail component. So from our perspective to be competitive, it's, it's very, very important to be fluent in mixed use developments and, and be able to offer our development partners a, a turnkey solution. Now that, that being said, there certainly are some challenges. Um, I would say, you know, again, we're not in the condo hotel space. I think in the condo hotel space, the simple reality is, and I, yeah, I have spent some of my career on the development side, 13 years with a company in North America that did 90 plus condo hotel projects worldwide. And, and what we found in that, overall we were very, very, very successful, but what we found is that the success criteria that you needed to see to have a successful condo hotel really had to be met. You had to be very, very careful about where you did, did a condo hotel and, and where you didn't. And if you, if you pick the right markets, uh, it was an enormous success and all stakeholders, including this consumer, benefited. The challenge is when it gets pushed, pushed too far. In the branded residential space, which is really where we spend our time today, I think probably for, for a luxury operator like ourselves, probably the, the, what keeps us up at night is really the licensing of our, our brand and the pieces of the residential pie that we don't control directly. And, and sales and marketing is really at the heart of that. So of course in our hotels, we're directing, supervising, leading the sales and marketing activity. In the branded residential model, we're licensing the brand. We certainly have approval processes and we work very closely with our partners. But at the end of the day, they're hiring the sales teams, they're doing the marketing and, and, and so on. So to make that model successful, it's really critically important that, that the operator understand the business model from the perspective of the developer. So we need to be very sensitive to our development partner needs, you know, you know speed to market, being able to operate efficiently, effectively, and, and so on. And of course, the same is true the other way. The, the development partners really need to sort of understand the business model from our perspective understand the sensitivities of, in brand. And, and when you build those partnerships, which we oftentimes spend months, if not years, sort of working up to, the, the model can be successful. Beyond that, I think, you know, the challenges are, you know, around structure. Uh, getting the right governing document solution in place is, is critical, not just for the, for the hotel owner and the operator, but certainly from the consumer. It's gotta be uh, protective. Uh, we've spent a lot of time with our Raffles Residence Project in Jakarta trying to get uh, that right to make sure the project, not only making sure that the project that Chaputra delivers uh, at T1 at handover is world class, but ensuring that there's a structure in place to, to maintain that quality uh, over time. Uh, and so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of effort that goes in there. And then, you know, I think that the owner relations side, which has been touched on a couple of times, owner services side, that is challenging. You know, we, we kind of look at it as we have one big owner with a sort of a capital O and then several small owners. And, and some of our peers in the space have sort of tended to lead that side of it to the development partners. And, and that's the, the one area where I think we've sort of set ourselves apart where we take on owner services directly and it really is that turnkey solution. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's very simple and straightforward. I'm working on a project right now with 19 units uh, and so on. So we do do a lot of very boutique stuff, but at the other end of the spectrum, we've got a project with 382 units. Uh, and, and so there is a lot to manage and, 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 and so on. But I think it's also an opportunity for ourselves and others in the space to really differentiate and, and create significantly more value for, for ownership partners. Penny? 
Um, yes, <coughs> uh, about this matter about the uh, ownership, we have, we uh, kind of like uh, made a mistake on one of our condo sales here that we uh, we don't we don't uh, hold a good portion out of it. We uh, only have a small portion. We sell everything off to, uh, to each individual owners, and uh, what's left is we we see the uh, the value of the property went up so high that we don't enjoy it at all. <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a trick of finding the balance between uh, the percentage of how much the developer has to own and has to take control, and how much you're going to sell off to uh, to the customers. So I think that's to to keep everything going smooth and to find a good balance is is a is a very good idea to to think about. So, so what are the developer? Sorry, the, the, the challenges you see as an operator I'm sorry? when you have that many individual owners, the challenges as an operator. Um, with the operator, we we have a buffer that uh, a, a company that that uh, distance the uh, each individual owners to to the operator, so they they, they don't get pound directly. So there's there's a buffer that soften the 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 pound. So that's that's what we how we do. Troy, challenges with owners. Operators, operators. You know what what, what is your <laughs> challenge um, as an operator? Challenge as an operator. Um, I think. When you go into a mixed-use um, uh, environment, the, the challenge is really the multiple owners and their expectations uh, and managing that relationship. Um, you know, you need to have a good, clean, uh, defined management agreement that sets boundaries, sets rules, allows the operator to operate. Uh, but on the flip side of that, you need to also be able to look after the owner and their interests. Um, whether you've got a developer that's maintained 40%, 60% of the stock and they've sold down 40%, that other 40% of owners still need to be looked after when they come and stay and they use their stays. It's important that you actually, you know, you look after their needs, their preferences, just like you would any normal uh, owner in a hotel management agreement. Um, you know, you have to understand, you know, their, their side. Uh, quite often, you know, the financials, um, you know, how they use it. Uh, you also then need to, as the operator or the brand, you need to also then look after your side, which is your brand and your image, uh, and make sure that's being looked after within that management agreement. Um, you know, it can get a little confusing because you can have the developer, the operator, plus um, unit owners, and then you've got, you know, agreements between everybody, and to make it all work, it can be, it can be quite a challenge. So I guess um, when we talk about buyers of residences and buyers of condo hotels, what's, what's your typical sort of, what are people buying into? Is it purely a residence? Is it an investment? Is it, is it? In, in Jakarta, it's, it's mostly owner, own, owner occupied. Um, so far, all the, all the uh, units that have been sold, all the owners have the intention to maintain that unit. Um, um, the units are also not being put back into a rental pool. Having said that, for for all the developments that we're considering at the moment, we would we would consider that having a having an, a large part of the inventory coming back into a rental pool to create that that additional revenue stream and being able to manage that. So, what is what is your typical sort of buyer? It's overall, sorry, your, your investors, your buyers, the and purchasers of the units are they? So far, most of the buyers have been Indonesian. Mm. Uh, the marketing has only just started, and there's going to be a large international marketing campaign for the property. Um, so we'll have to see what the results are of that. But I think in the end, we'll probably end up with about 70% domestic buyers, 30% overseas buyers. Jeff? Um, it's, it certainly varies very widely by project. Um, in our raffles residence, and some of that's, I think, simply a function of design, obviously, uh, target segments and so on. With our raffles residence project in Jakarta, we're seeing uh, overwhelmingly uh, domestic buyers. It really is more of a, a lifestyle, almost a trophy asset uh, uh, purchase. Uh, most of the purchases are from uh, Jakarta itself. There's, there's some sort of offshore participation, but typically it's Indonesians that are living abroad, uh, you know, coming back, spending part of their time uh, for, for business. Now, when I say it's a, it's a function and part of design, these are 450 square meter uh, luxury residences, four meter high ceilings, private elevator, uh, 
to each residence uh, and so on. It's not a product that lends itself necessarily to uh, rental income returns. And in fact, in that project, there isn't a, not only is it not condo hotel, but there, there isn't a, a rental program uh, offered. It really is a product that's designed for owner occupancy, personal usage, uh, lifestyle. Uh, but under the same brand in Manila, we have a product 237 units versus the 88 that were developed in, in Jakarta. Uh, the mix is different. It's one, two, three, and four bedrooms. Uh, the significant proportion, nearly 50% of it, are, are one bedrooms. And, and certainly that product has, has catered uh, much more to, relatively speaking, to an investment buyer. It's probably a 50-50 mix, 50% owner-occupiers, lifestyle, 50% investment slash uh, trophy asset. And I think the trophy aspect comes from oftentimes when we go into a market with either Raffles or, or a Fairmont branded residence, it really is a first of its kind of offering. If you look at the branded residential landscape, it's, it's still a relatively new product category. It's been around for 10 or 15 years. Uh, and when we go into markets, it, again, it is that sort of first of a kind. It's viewed as innovative, it's, it's viewed as, as fresh. And so typically the consumer that you, that you find opting for that is someone that's looking for something that's new, that's cutting edge, different from what their neighbor has, really is sort of an aspirational uh, purchase, if you will. Yeah, um, through our development, we are, we, our condo are mostly in Bali. Um, most of our, uh, our client, our buyers are uh, Domestically, domestic people. They are mostly from Java, some from uh, Medan, Balikpapan, Samarinda, um, those second cities of Indonesia. Um, the, the main purpose is actually, again, for investment, to uh, expecting capital gain, um, expecting return from the uh, rental, and a uh, free stay. So that's, that's what they expect. And um, we also get a few overseas client that uh, comes and purchase our property. Well, it's, it's uh, still um, a regulation that, we are, that they are waiting so that they can uh, buy more, I think, hopefully, especially in this situation. So, yes, Troy, you mentioned that you know, you, you're more into the value of, of, of the product, you know, the lifestyle and so on. Yeah, I think um, inter the international buyers tend to be more leaning towards that lifestyle um, or trophy buy um, here in Bali, and your domestic um, buyers tend to be a little bit more focused towards the ROI and um, the financial return. I think for the international buyers, um, you know, they get the value out of it through two ways. They get a small uh, return on investment financially, but the value in their, their, their ownership is that they come to Bali and if it's their 21, 30 days, 40 days, whatever the agreement is with, with the actual purchase, is um, a time for them to come on holiday without a cost to them. Um, it's looked after by the operator and sold by the operator for the rest of the year. It's hands-free. Uh, they don't have to do a lot of uh, their own work um, to actually manage it, so it becomes you know, a, a hands-free asset that they can actually utilise themselves and get that financial return. Um, domestically, well, they're already here, and, and for them, the focus isn't so much um, uh, lifestyle and probably more towards the ROI and the, and the true financial return of their investment when they buy their apartment or villa. So, I see in um, Indonesia and Bali, we've, we've seen specific, we've seen a lot of um, uh, developers coming on the market promising 8% ROIs, returns, uh, two years of front, and so on. But we also see some challenges uh, with that. Uh, is, w w what is an, you know, a realistic ROI when we look at, at, at this? You're doing mainly residences, but maybe when you look at the market from a operator perspective, you know, the expectations might be a bit too high for these investors. I think some of the investors will basically buy only with the requirement of, of, of hopefully seeing capital appreciation over a longer period of time. Um, I know there's other segments in the market where the individual buyers are very hopeful of, of a higher return. I've seen advertising in the market where there are guaranteed returns, sometimes 
up to uh, up to eight percent, ten percent, for three to five years in a row. Uh, I'm not sure in how far those developers calculate, you know, this percentage into their selling price so that they offset that that um, that liability. Uh, but it seems quite it seems quite aggressive in the market. I, I think it's going to continue to be aggressive. There's more developments coming coming out. I see a lot more advertising um, in in-flight magazines, uh, in, in publications. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how how that develops further. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think <coughs> rental or income stream guarantees are interesting. We um, in, in terms of our brand, Swiss Hotel Raffles and Fairmont, we we don't touch them. We don't get involved with them. Um, we certainly understand their place in the marketplace, and I, and I tend to agree with Arjan. There, it's a repackaged discount more more times than not. And, and I think our version to them is really twofold. As, as soon as you apply it, uh, immediately you're positioning the residential product as an investment vehicle. And, and our instinct is that if if your only driver for purchasing a branded residence is is as an, an investment, particularly for the income stream. There probably are better investments to, to look at. If, if the value proposition that you're looking for is is lifestyle, uh, spending time with family, uh, a, a luxury residence, but with the added benefit that you can drive some rental income when you're not using it, well, that's a different story, and I think there's a place for our brands in, in, in that particular segment. But, but we tend to, in, to avoid uh, any sort of guaranteed return whatsoever. And that's not simply, uh, you know, our development partners will often say to us, well, could we apply, could we provide the guarantee? And in theory, of course, they could, but even, even then we still avoid it, again, because it sort of repositions the product is, is something that you know we're really not interested in, in sort of participating. That's not to say that investment isn't one of the things that our customers are looking for when they buy a Raffles, a Fairmont, or a Swiss Hotel residence. It certainly is. I think it's in, important to any investment, uh, sorry, to any residential purchaser, and, and our products deliver in that regard. But it's it's just one piece of the value proposition, and it's just one piece that the, that the brand delivers on. Funny. <laughs> um, return of investment. We uh, we would like to say eight to ten percent, but then if, uh, if whatever happened today will it, it, it is is a very very difficult very difficult number to reach because uh, you know our competition and everything has become so tight. Uh, last year we do slightly less than that, and. Um, of course, uh, towards the end, the owner is not very happy about that. Um, but uh, over on the uh, rental guarantees and everything, we uh, yeah, just do it like you do. We, do. We, we don't give it up because I, we think it's, uh, and I think the customer today, they are quite smart. They know they, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, mathematical things. Um, they, they, they can count, they can count, they can uh, judge how much exactly your, your value when you give it out to them. But um, Overall, uh, it still works. Some people still uh, look into that, uh, mainly because they don't really understand the uh, the industry. They still they they, ex they expect the good number that we tell them, that we promise them, and um, if we fail, of course, things happen. Twice. Um, yeah, the guaranteed returns is it usually falls in the operator's lap at the at the end of the guaranteed time period, you know, um, you provide an eight to 10% guarantee and then uh, for three years and in the fourth year it drops down to where it really is, um, you know, you end up with a situation where you have unhappy owners who thought that that was gonna continue on. The developer by that time has moved on and um, it's the operator's fault. Um, you know, I think the reality is is that these sorts of investments, they do have a lifestyle element to them uh, quite often one that's not sold properly, uh, information and, um, you know, education on what you're actually buying. I mean, uh, that lifestyle component comes back to the value in the time that you get to use the product, the quality of the product that you're, that you're actually going and staying in. Um, you know, uh, if you were to own a, a, a branded, um, if you were to go on holiday and stay in a branded 
um, hotel on the beach in Seminyak, it would cost you $500, $600 a night and, or more in high season. And if you're going and staying there for 30 days, I mean, essentially, you are enjoying a product at that value for 30 days. So, you know, you need to, you need to actually educate the buyer to say, look, this is where you are getting value, not just focusing on the financial uh, return. Um, I mean, from the developer's point of view, the guaranteed um, uh, return for three to five years is a good way to actually get the, the lot sold. Uh, but does it, does it lead to a uh, harmonious ending? I'm not sure. So we talked a little bit earlier about you know, premium for the developers, um, brand premium and so on. Um, is that the case also for an end user when it comes to a resale, they want to sell their units, so there's a premium to the brand? That, I think, very much so, especially for, for the high-end luxury. Um, I think, I mean, developers would expect up to, up to a 15% premium for a branded residential because it, it's, it creates a, a level of, uh, of comfort for the end users. Um, when you look at other products where there's more of a, of a requirement, it's an investment and it's marketed as an investment product. I think the individual buyers would still look at end usage of a lifestyle product combined with an annual return and on top of that potential capital appreciation. And the combination of that is what, what they're really buying into. Because otherwise, you know, in Indonesia, you can go to the bank and, and uh, put your money in the bank for a fixed deposit for a year. I'm not sure, Benny, what, what, is, the fixed, what is the interest rate now for a year? Up to 8%? 6, 6, 7%. 6, 7%. So, you know, that would be considered a low risk uh, capital appreciation of 7% a year by just putting your money in the bank. Um, so I think individual buyers do, do expect a lot, a lot more in terms of lifestyle, in terms of being able to make use of their unit, in terms of, of capital appreciation and annual returns on the operating income, however way that, that's being structured. How do you see it, Jeff, the resale one? Yeah, I think uh, overall very strong. I think. Uh, particularly in the, in the for sale branded residence space where the product is, is marketed and sold to the owner occupiers and you know, sometimes with a healthy mix of uh, investment buyers in there as, as well. I, I think the challenge you see in the condo hotel space is that sometimes what happens in the condo hotel space when brands have gotten involved, the brand can sometimes bring some hype and excitement to the project which can lead to an initial sort of surge in, in values. But those products over time, because of their nature, and you have to, I think, remember with condo hotel products, the personal access to it is usually severely restricted. So you're talking about 14 to 28 days of, of personal usage. And so really, you know, after the excitement of the sales launch, you know, three, four years into operation, it really is just an investment vehicle. And so if it's sold in a market where the expectation is a 4% return, typically the value corrects itself to that return. And so if people are looking at the market and they expect a 4% return, there's a multiple that gets applied to that. So you, you know, you take whatever the rental stream is, multiply it by 25, and if you look at those products over time, 10, 15 years after their launch, if you look at markets where those products are certainly now 15 years old, that's typically what you're seeing. In the for sale branded residence space, particularly in urban markets where these are at the very, very top end of the market, that's where the brand is adding a, a significant, significant value because not only are our development partners creating a world-class product, but the brand is really preserving the value of that asset over time through the governing documents that were put in place, through the reserve, the cap assets management, by having an international operator really safeguard the value of that asset. And of course, with the value proposition that development partners built in by co-locating it with the hotel. So in those examples, you know, we see some great success stories. Uh, our Raffles Residence project in Manila set records for highest price per square meter for the most expensive uh, apartment ever sold. Uh, we had a, a Fairmont uh, Residences project in, in Canada that was uh, launched in 2006, 2007. It was launched at about $1,400 a square foot. There was a, a resale last year at $4,000 a square foot, which set the record in that country for 
again, highest priced uh, uh, apartment ever sold. So we see the value being preserved over time and in some cases e even enhanced. But I think, again, you've got to make a distinction between where the product sort of sits in the spectrum of, of you know, branded residential. Is it on the condo hotel side or is it in the, what we would call the, the for sale owner occupancy oriented branded residence side? Um, I just have to add that uh, from a developer point of view that uh, for this uh, uh, for this property, this kind of, this type of property, we just have to be very conservative and very honest to uh, educate the customers, tell the truth, and uh, don't promise that w that we can, don't give them promise that we can't keep. That's that's uh, what we do uh, so far. But if, if, even though we uh, lately uh, in uh, previous year we uh, kind of like failing to keep our promise, but. Uh, the number is still not that, that far apart. So in the Indonesian market, you see a slowdown in the typical condotel sales? Yes. Yes, very much. Troy? Um, I think I agree um, with Jeff. It, I mean, it's really, it really depends on the actual, the individual hotel or development that you're looking at and where it sits in that spectrum on its financial returns. Is it 2.5%? Is it 6%? Is it where is it? And that, that'll that will then fuel the potential for any real sales. Um, the issue is, is that with it being such a, a, a new sort of industry here, or, or it's, it's a growing sort of um, theme that we have here in Bali with condo tells not so much uh, talking about Jakarta, but you know the option for the resale when there is so much more new product coming on, um, is there a tendency for people to buy in on a new product um, that has got a guaranteed return attached to it as opposed to going in and buying in on something that's established. Uh, both have their risk, the established one, at least then it's, you know, it's transparent, you know what it's operating at, you know what the return is, and then the decision gets a little bit easier. Um, obviously, if the operator's, um, you know, credible and is performing well, then obviously you've got a little bit more faith in it. New developments um, with uh, traditional hotel management companies moving into uh, the, the, the mixed use sort of management, um, you know, it, it's yet to be seen. Can they pull it off? Can they manage that 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 element? Um, and you know, uh, do you buy into that instead of doing uh, buying something that's established? So the resale market will be affected here in Bali by the by the actual extra supply that's coming on and how well how well the products that are existing are performing. So I guess um, when we look at the different brands and the different options that we talk about expat markets, is, is that a big driving force for the markets in, in Indonesia? Is that a big portion of your, your end buyers? Um, also maybe a little bit about the legal challenges of foreigners. I've seen Bali, there's a lot of talk now about ownership structures, nominees and so on. We heard yesterday from the panel of the ministers that they're looking at these economical zones, which in theory is gonna make it a lot easier. Um, but we see that, that the foreigners aren't that important into the Indonesian market. It's very much dominated by the domestic market. Is that? I think it would be welcoming for foreign investors and individual residences for the legal side to be uh, much simpler. If there's a, a, an easier ownership structure for foreign ownership, I think it would definitely be welcomed. Uh, I, I understand that there are a lot of owners that, that, that own property through a nominee structure. But I think if they would have the chance to own a property under their own name, whatever the restrictions would be imposed by the government, I think they would really welcome that. So did you see a lot of uh, foreigners investing into your uh, properties? Um, about 30%. Hmm. Well, I mean, certainly on the extended stay side of our business, expats are a key driver. So our, our Fairmont project that we just opened in J Jakarta, where we have 108 Fairmont service residences, which is, again, the extended stay segment for us. Uh, expat, that's a great market, uh, extended stay in Jakarta, and expats are, are a key driver of it. Uh, on the for sale branded residence side, uh, frankly, expats have been... Uh, there has been some activity in, in our Jakarta project under the Raffles brand. Uh, not a lot. I think uh, that is a, a function partially of the design and who the product uh, uh, caters to and who it was designed for. Uh, but it, I think also it, it does touch on some of the, the foreign ownership uh, issues, the fact that there's still 
you know, a, a sort of a, an unease or a wariness surrounding nominee structures, corporate vehicles, uh, and, and the like. I think, frankly, uh, right now, from our own perspective as a brand, we're probably more comfortable if the product's designed for a d domestic market. We're encouraged, uh, you know, by some of the things that we think, you know, may be coming down the pipe in terms of strengthening the regime for foreign ownership. I think it could be a, obviously a great catalyst for the market, and I think probably uh, very timely. It, it Maybe the only other thing to add, which I think is, you know, optimistic for both developers and operators in the branded residential space, you know, as those regimes strengthen, there's a tremendous amount of value that the brands, particularly the international brands, can operate. And one of the areas where we've seen brands add a lot of value in internationally marketed projects is in relationship to offshore buyers. If you look at, you know, the developments partners of ourselves and our peers in the industry, they are uh, uh, universally, you know, the best developers, the leading developers in the respective markets. Uh, they're often household names, but household names either within cities or, or nationally, whereas the brands typically resonate uh, globally and oftentimes have real currency in sort of the offshore markets that might be buying in. So I think as, as the foreign ownership regime continues to mature, mature there'll be even more opportunity to, to, for the brands to add value because the brands typically resonate in, in key source markets. So in the Australias, uh, in the Middle East, where we see a lot of buyers with, with interest in Jakarta, with interest in Bali. Benny? Well, we are waiting for the um, new regulation to come up. Um, right now, we still do as what we do. We do to normally to corporate, norm, uh, corporate buyers. Um, uh, we are hoping uh, a, good, a good jump on a number of foreign, uh, foreign property owners, in, uh, especially in Jakarta, where they show great interest and uh, they, they come and ask about uh, ownership in Jakarta. Um, hopefully, uh, they, they could come up with that new regulation in a very short time. It will be a lot easier for us to, uh, to, get, to get a new customer, a new buyer. And um, well, uh, again, uh, when the new regulation comes up, I hope uh, all the uh, government officials are ready so that they can trigger it right away in a very short time. So, Troy, you're now in Bali. Um, your expats, what what kind of structure do they sort of try to invest under? Is it a lease? Is it a do they set up a uh, an owned company, PMA, or look, there's a, there's all kinds of structures that are out there that sort of use the Indonesian law to the to the fullest to actually gain security for the overseas buyer. Um, some are leaseholds, some are a head lease with a PMA company. People then buy shares in it, or there's an offshore entity that owns the onshore entity. There's uh, the subleases. Um, I think with the new um, regulation that's uh, proposed to be coming in. That'll change things for the expat, in particular for the expat or for someone who's buying from overseas. Typically, if you were to buy um, an apartment, uh, if you were an Australian and you were to buy an apartment in Australia, um, you could then actually use that asset for further financing into other investments. Whereas if it sits over here, it's sort of locked away and you don't really get that leverage usage on the asset here. So getting a bit more security over that may actually then open up other forms of financing for owners, uh, for expats as well, which could then actually fuel, you know, um, more interest in moving into Indonesia and buying these sorts of products. So I guess we, we look at the market now and it's sort of maturing. Where do you see the sort of branded resident market go in Indonesia and maybe where would you invest um, if you were investing yourself in, into Indonesian branded residents? That's a really good question. Um, I think, I think I would, I mean, as, a, as an expert, I, I would wait for the legislation to come, to come through and see how it would be implemented first before, you know, before being comfortable with it, knowing that it's a proven solution to, to ownership here in Indonesia. I think there will be more, more pressure on the nominee structure over the, over the years to come uh, from, from a government perspective. And I think um, for also the, our legal counsel to, to, uh, to basically uh, continue to be up to date with the changes in the legislation. 
that's really important. So when we work on the legal side of development in Indonesia, we'll always work with, an inter with, an, with our legal counsel from Hong Kong, combined with uh, a local counsel who is very much up to date with the changes in, in Indonesia. I think is really important. I think in terms of branded residential, we, we see Indonesia as, as uh, you know, being in the, in the early stages, we see a significant opportunity over the next uh, decade for branded residences. I, I think the, the, the key two areas are going to continue to be Jakarta uh, and Bali. In, in Jakarta, I think from a buyer's perspective, uh, you know, over the next 24 months, there's probably a little bit of an opportunity there. Uh, the market's obviously taking, taking a breather, but, uh, you know, the fundamentals look very, very strong, and I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to do very exciting, innovative projects in that market, and I think there's a lot of demand uh, for that, and I think we're just sort of scratching the surface. In, in Bali, I, I, we do see opportunity. Uh, we think there's a very interesting opportunity for our private residence club uh, concept here, the Fairmont Heritage uh, Place brand. Uh, shared ownership is a segment that, that certainly has some traction. Uh, but there really isn't anything uh, in, the, in the luxury space. And Heritage Place, I think, sort of bridges that gap between lifestyle and investment. Heritage Place uh, can work very well with a, with a rental program, but it's an optional uh, rental program. And, and the sort of the core driver is lifestyle and all the, the incredible features uh, that make Bali so special. And then similarly in the branded residential space, you know, there's, there's still certainly opportunity here. Uh, but I think it, it comes down to product design. It's got to be the right brand, the right product design, the right location. And if you can check off those sort of three fundamentals, uh, there's some exciting opportunities here as well. You pretty much explain everything. <laughs> yes, uh, we, the, the, the market will be mainly on the upper scale and luxury uh, segment. And um, the way I see it, location, is still the number one factor on the, on, on the project. Where we choose the location, where the, um, the, uh, the access and the uh, facilities all around it will be the, the main issues. Where the uh, foreign buyers gonna gonna come and uh, tap into the market, that's, that's where they, they're, gonna, they're gonna go. So look into that. Do, do you see um, movements beyond now, the traditional Jakarta Bali market, you know, Lombok, Flores, other areas? Um, Probably Bali. We uh, start seeing that uh, they uh, they are a little a little more um, agitated to go and and and, uh, and, and purchase. Uh, Jakarta definitely it's a it's a, the main the main um, investment that they, where they're gonna go on, a, on a, as a as a foreign foreign buyer. Uh, Lombok we see. Um, I think it's going to be in a, in a mid market and a luxury market. That's how for Lombok. That's how I see it. Troy? Um, I think, um, again, obviously location, as has already been mentioned, and I don't want to cover off from what the guys have already said, but um, if I was going to be looking at investing, I'd probably look at that um, mid to upper scale, um, only because you've just seen you know, a rush on that three star market, you've seen the economy mm -hmm. start to to boom domestically and that market will mature and they'll move they'll move up the ranks so they'll move from that three star to that so four four star so I think you're probably going to be looking at a, a larger mass of people sitting in that four to four four and a half star market in the next five to ten years as they all sort of start to, to, to develop I think in addition to the traditional we always talk about Bali and and, uh, and Jakarta but I think there's other places that will come up over the years, over the years to come, and Bintan has a lot more movement now mm. on the resident, branded residential space uh, across the whole spectrum: condos, um, uh, timeshare, mm. um, villas, uh, branded residential. So uh, I'm keen to see what what other what other places will develop further. Someone want to add on to that? Do you see opportunities beyond um, beyond Lombok? You know? Lombok, Lombok is yeah. getting hot. Yeah. I see in the domestic market that's really yes. something that, that people are asking about. They, they, they look at the better capital gain maybe than, than what they could yeah, get in Bali now. Yeah. We are Lombok, Lombok's price is still like one tenth of Bali. Mm. That's, that's, that's why they are, they are interested to get into. They, they, they see the, uh, the gap, they see the, uh, the capital gain they might get in a very short time. 
Is Mantra looking at opportunities, Lombok? Uh, we've looked at a couple of projects over at uh, Lombok. We've also looked at Bintan. Um, Bintan's uniquely placed. It's you know, it's right there. It's been a po it's been popular with the Singaporeans for a while. Diving um, to Cartons now moving up there. So I mean that's got a, a good potential of to sort of you know be a short range sort of destination for weekends, holidays, three four day trips for those for those markets. So um, that would be a good one. All right. I think we're. More or less to the end of this, I want to thank you, everyone, for the thank participation. You. A big round of applause, maybe, from the audience for guys. Thank you. Thank you.